Welcome back and welcome to this tutorial in which I hope to provide you with an overview of the cerebral cortex and cortical circuits. I know I've said this repeatedly so far in the course but we truly are dealing with the most complex organ to be found in the human body. And when we talk about the organization of the cerebral cortex and cortical circuits we're largely looking at the product of genetic instructions that are determining how these circuits are going to form and uh, how they provide for the foundation of all the amazing functions that our cortical networks perform for us. One of them is we are endowed with curiosity, with a sense of wonderment, and I hope that capacity is being well exercised uh, so far in this course. As we turn our consideration to the cerebral cortex and cortical networks, we can't help but to be reminded of the importance of this part of the human nervous system for health and wellness and optimal, optimal functioning. And we can't help but to be reminded of the hundreds of thousands of people that are living worldwide with neurological disability because of some problem in the development or in the ongoing health status of the cerebral cortex and its networks. With a reminder of those core concepts in the field of neuroscience that are at stake today, let me point you to our learning objectives for this session. I want you to be able to discuss the embryological origin of the cerebral cortex. I want you to be able to discuss differences in the cellular architecture that we find from one region of the cortex to another. And I want you to be able to discuss uh, not only what's different from one region to another, but, but what's conserved. And that would be the anatomical organization of what we'll call the cortical microcircuit. And lastly, I want to give you a bit of an acronym that might help you remember what are some of the principal functions of that microcircuit. And I call that the ACC of the cortical microcircuit. Okay, well let's begin with just a bit of embryology. Now, the cerebral cortex and all the networks contained therein arise from the most anterior swelling that develops in early embryonic life. And that anterior swelling of the developing neural tube is called the prosencephalon. I'll just remind you that the nervous system is derived from the walls of a tube. And the anterior end of that tube is closed, and that's what we call the prosencephalon or the forebrain. So it's going to be a massive swelling that will form at the anterior end of this developing neural tube. As we proceed on with gestation, this um, prosencephalon further subdivides into a diencephalon and a telencephalon. And it's from this telencephalic vesicle that the cerebral cortex will develop. The cerebral cortex basically becomes this outer rind of tissue this outer wall of this developing telencephalon. As we progress in human gestation into the third trimester, the outer wall begins to take the shape that we are more familiar with from our journeys into the adult human brain. So what we see now is a cerebral hemisphere with some of the primary sulci or fissures beginning to take shape. So uh, in the third trimester, a pregnancy is when we begin to appreciate the central sulcus, the lateral fissure, and many of our other primary uh, sulci and gyri that we saw when we looked at the human brain together in the lab. And as we look inside this brain, if we were to take a cross-section, what we would observe is an outer cortex, which means bark, like the bark on a tree. Uh, the outer rind of tissue. So the cerebral cortex is this outermost layer that we observe when we look through a cross-section through the forebrain. Well, it's really incredible to consider that the closed anterior end of the neural tube eventually takes this marvelous shape of the cerebral cortex in the human brain. So it, it really... Um, is one of the grand achievements both in the evolution of the mammalian nervous system but also 
in the development of each of you. And um, we should just never forget uh, the just incredible achievement in uh, mammalian biology that's represented by the human cerebral cortex. Well, part of the story of how that cortex came to be has to do with many cycles of cell division in early nervous system development. And so uh, there is, as you might imagine, an exquisite set of control mechanisms that are responsible for producing the neurons that are needed to populate the nervous system. And for reasons that are not fully understood, it seems as though the strategy for creating the nervous system and largely that cerebral cortex is to create about twice as many neurons that will actually survive the process of brain development into early childhood. And believe it or not, you've had about twice as many neurons in your brain uh, during early embryonic life than what you now have. And that's true of, of those of you that are younger and true of those of you that may be older, uh, certainly. Uh, so the, there is a process in brain development that we'll talk about in due course whereby cells are programmed to die. And some of that cell death seems to be the result of the failure of some competitive mechanism. Uh, some of it occurs for reasons that uh, no one quite understands. Uh, but be that as it may, the proliferation of cells is obviously a key component in building a brain. So this happens in a region of the central nervous system that's very close to the ventricles, uh, very close to that lumen of the developing neural tube. There's an interesting dance that we'll come to talk about in a little while as the cell cycle proceeds where nuclei uh, divide and DNA is replicated in different zones within the wall of that neural tube. But eventually uh, cells exit the cell cycle and um, become what we call neuroblasts. These neuroblasts go on to differentiate into neurons and glia uh, meanwhile, a progenitor cell is left behind that can continue to divide uh, or perhaps differentiate eventually into a stem cell that may uh, remain competent to re-enter the cell cycle at some later point uh, across the lifespan. Well, after many cycles of mitotic activity, uh, the neuroblasts that result uh, will migrate over some vast territory within the central nervous system. And for the building up of a cerebral cortex, that is an outer bark, there must be a migration of cells from this inner region, uh, close to the ventricle, to this outer bark, where a cortex is going to be built. And we call that developing cortex the cortical plate. So here, very close to the ventricle, is the site where the cells divide and the neuroblasts uh, first exit the cell cycle. Well, in order for these neuroblasts to get from the ventricular zone to the presumptive cortex, that is the cortical plate, they migrate. And they migrate along a scaffold provided by radial glial cells. Radial glial cells extend a process from the peel surface uh, down to uh, the ventricular region of the wall of the neural tube, and it provides a means by which a neuroblast then can migrate by shimmying along this fiber. So through this migratory stream, the neurons that are in the process of differentiating can come to populate this cortical plate. And as a consequence of this grand migration of neuroblasts from deep within the walls of the tube to this outer bark, this outer cortical plate, we end up developing a sheet of cells that uh, reside out here in this outer region of the developing wall of the neural tube. Now this sheet is actually continuous across the entire cerebral mantle. You might not appreciate that if all we had in view was the adult form of the human brain, but everywhere you see cerebral cortex we have a continuous sheet of cells. And as I've told you elsewhere, if we take the amount of cortex that can be found in one cerebral hemisphere and flatten it all out, we'd have something about the dimensions of what in most countries is a medium-sized pizza dough. 
or a medium sized pizza. Now that uh, the dough of that pizza uh, would have to be very thin. Uh, here in the United States we call that a New York style pizza with a very thin crust because after all the cerebral mantle, the cerebral gray matter is only a few millimeters thick. In some parts of the world uh, the pizza is made in deep dish style so that wouldn't be a good model for the uh, cortex of the hemisphere. We'd have to uh, travel to Manhattan and uh, enjoy that crispy thin crust pizza that's characteristic of that part of the world. Well, anyway, I hope you um, can resonate with this picture of a single sheet of cells that is folded into the shape of the four lobes of the cerebral hemisphere. So, uh, I want to emphasize for the purposes of this tutorial that this sheet of cells, it's not just one cell thick, of course, there are actually many hundreds, perhaps even thousands of neurons that constitute the thickness of that sheet. And we can appreciate that when we look under the microscope at uh, the cerebral cortex in its adult form that has been stained in various ways to demonstrate the presence of neurons. So I'd like to show you some images that I prepared myself in my own lab. And on the left what we have is a preparation that shows us the presence of what's called nissel substance within the cell bodies of the neurons and the glial cells that populate the cerebral cortex. And on the right, we have a stain for a um, neurofilament that is especially enriched in large neurons. There are a variety of ways that we could prepare stains of the cerebral cortex that highlight its features, and they all show uh, a similar theme, and that is an abundance of neurons that populate that cortical sheet uh, but those neurons are ordered and they're structured into layers. Now, sometimes those layers are not so easy to appreciate, uh, but nevertheless, histologists over the years have agreed that it is possible to recognize uh, typically six layers in most divisions of the cerebral cortex. The first layer is considered just this outer layer, uh, which is right up against the peel surface. So, so this is the peel layer out here, and just below the peel layer is a region where we don't find a whole lot of neurons. What we find here is actually a whole bunch of axons and myelinated axons. Uh, so we can think of this as a little bit of white matter at the very extreme edge of our cerebral cortex. Well, just below that layer one, where we don't have many cells, we tend to have a pretty distinct population of neurons that have a particular shape and form that are not particularly obvious to us here in this nissel stain, but through other staining methods, we might see them stand out just a little bit better. So that's what we call cortical layer two. Cortical layer three is actually a broad layer that uh, extends for, for some, some distance here. And people have subdivided this layer in various ways in different parts of the brain. We won't worry about that. Here I'll just highlight that this is one place where we find these larger pyramidal neurons that have um, enriched um, concentrations of this neurofilament protein that stands out here to the right. But um, in stark contrast, we come to the next layer of cortex, which is called layer four. Now layer four is really important, and I hope that you um, can recognize its importance as we talk through our sensory systems. Layer four is the target of our first order or principal thalamic nuclei that are sending signals into this cortical network. So each of our sensory systems, for example, will have a region of the thalamus that sends its inputs into layer four. So layer four is what we call the thalamic recipient zone. It's the first place that gets information from the thalamus that then cortical networks can operate upon. And as we see in the nissel stain to the left, layer four is populated by uh, smaller cells. Uh, these cells are often called stellate cells because of their star-like appearance. And sometimes they can be so dense that they sort of look like grains of sand or grains of salt in a salt shaker. So we sometimes call layer four uh, the granular layer of the cortex because of the appearance of these grains of sand. Now notice that layer four is almost completely devoid of large neurons expressing this neurofilament. So uh, layer four actually stands out perhaps a little bit better in the image to the right than the image to the left. Well, right below layer four, 
is of course layer 5 and layer 5 is home to some of the largest pyramidal cells that we have in the cerebral cortex. These uh, pyramidal cells stain beautifully with this SMI32 stain. We see their cell bodies and their dendrites heading out towards the peel surface. And there is more space that is evident between the cell bodies that we see in the nissle stain. That space isn't empty. It's actually filled up with synaptic connections. So layer 5 is a place where there is rich synaptic connectivity among its neurons. Well, just below layer 5, uh, finally we have layer 6. Layer 6, in some respects, resembles layer 4. There is a concentration of small cells uh, that are more densely packed, uh, sort of the way we have here in layer 4. And with respect to this SMI32 stain, layer 6 is, uh, like layer 4, uh, devoid of cellular staining. And finally, below layer 6, we have the white matter that underlies the cerebral cortex.